the career court okay. in it right there. Yeah. Like, okay. So we're good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so thanks for having me. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, so as Ann said, housing support service is a relative new service from the DDA, the Developmental Disabilities Administration. So just in general, you probably should already know, but the DDA is the Developmental Disabilities Administration, and that's the state agency that funds almost all of the ARC services and almost all of the disability services other than the Department of Mental Health has their own set of services. And then there's DOORS, Division of Rehab Services. They do some limited services for kids while they're still in school and for adults who are out of school, but they only do vocational, you know, job readiness kind of stuff. So DDA is the big one. So if you haven't applied to DDA yet, go ahead and do that. There's no age limit. You could, you know, I, I'm sure the schools start talking about it at age 14, right, at the BCP, IEP meetings. Um, it's pretty easy to apply for a state service. You just, if the application is big, but it's mostly check boxes, you're in, the kids are in school, so you have school records, the school happy to provide the records to you. Submit that to DDA. Someone will come out and they do what they call a comprehensive assessment, but they don't really do any testing or anything. They, but they do meet with the student in person they ask about how the disability affects their ability to function independently and they review the records you provide them so they don't they call it a comprehensive assessment but it's really them compiling the information you give them and then you get a letter um, and several weeks later you'll get a letter from the developmental disabilities administration actually they'll say the department of health and mental hygiene on the letterhead um, and it'll say one of four things you're not eligible. Hopefully it won't say that. They need more documentation, which is easy. You can just get some more records, send it in. Um, they uh, That your support's only eligible, which is a partial eligibility that most states don't have, um, and, or you're fully developmentally disabled, DD eligible. That's the one you want, fully DD eligible. If you don't have that, appeal it. Try to figure out how to appeal. There's the whole, in the eligibility letter, there's going to be, most of the pages in, in the packet are going to be about how to appeal. So that's what you want to do. The easiest way to appeal is just provide some additional documentation, maybe get some older school records to support the most recent thing um, or some current, more current evaluations. Um, but that's critical. Supports only is what I was mentioning to Joyce the other day. Supports only is a partial eligibility. Most states don't have that category. What it means is you your disability is not severe enough to meet the definition of full development and disabled according to the state law, or your disability occurred after age 22. And no matter how severe the disability is after age 22, it doesn't matter. You can only be supports only eligible. There's no appeal for that. That's just the way the law is. So somebody that's in a car, uh, motorcycle accident at age 23 and is severely brain damaged, they're only going to be supports eligible. If that happened at 19, he would be DD eligible and eligible for the whole range of services. If you're, the reason DDA has that category that in theory you can get services and there's people getting services and supports only that are kind of grandfathered in, um, that's state only money though. So the other part of being, um, getting DDA services, you have to apply, you have to, when you first apply, you're gonna be added to the wait list. Uh, being eligible for DDA and being a priority for funding are two different things. So when you're determined eligible, you get that letter saying your son or daughter is developmentally disabled, meets the DD category. That's great, but that doesn't mean you're going to get services right away. That means you're on the waiting list. And then DDA has various priority categories to make, determine who is eligible to be funded for services in that particular year. So there's lots of different funding categories. The most common one and how most people get into services is as a transition youth initiative. And that's a special pot of money for kids who are exiting school at age 21. So that's how most people get their foot in the door with DDA. And then they can, once you're in this services, you can get additional services. Um, so that's a special pot of money that's usually fully funded. Um, so that's, um, you know, that's the, the most common way that people get eligible for funding through DDA. DDA also has a new waiver called the family support waiver, which is for um, children under age 21, um, and they're supposed to, DDA is supposed to serve 400 families a year off the waiting list under the family support waiver. It has a more limited scope of services, um, but um, it's targeted for kids to start getting services while they're still in school. So that's a bonus, but there's different priority categories within that waiver as well. Um, so the other part of the DDA eligibility, when you are determined eligible, 
you have to get into one of the be eligible for one of their waivers, which is means that they can get Medicaid money. That the waiver is just a Medicaid waiver, which means your son or daughter would be eligible for medic Medicaid funding in Maryland. That's called medical assistance. Um, you don't have to have it in the community. The um, they'll, DDA will help you apply for that waiver when you're a priority for funding. So that's why you don't want to be supports only eligible because supports only eligible are not eligible for the waiver. So in theory, you could get some services from DDA, but DDA is not making that a priority because you're not eligible for the matching Medicaid money. So I was, uh, that was a lot of information, but the, you don't really need to worry about much of any of that. The key is when you apply to DDA, if you get a letter that says your son or daughter is DD eligible, you're good to go. If it's anything else, appeal it or talk to somebody about it because you need to try to get that changed. Um, and then when you get the letter from DDA saying your son or daughter meets the category for DD, they're also going to have a letter in there saying you need to pick one of the um, CCS agencies, which is coordinate, coordination, coordinators of community services. And that is a case management agency for DDA. So there's six different ones, I believe now in this region. Um, so you pick there's seven now, but yeah, there's okay. several to choose from. Yeah. So the letter will pay pick. It's up to you to choose. Um, likely one of those agencies have also done the comprehensive assessment because DDA does some of them themselves, but most of them, they farm out to these CCS agencies. Um, you don't need to pick the one that did the comprehensive assessment, but lots of people do. It's completely up to you. It's probably not going to be that same worker that you met. If you really like that person that did the interview, it probably won't be that person because most CCS agencies have like a specialist that do the eligibility piece and then they get a case management piece, but it's completely up to you. You pick the agency you want and you send that letter back to DDA and then they're going to assign uh, your son or daughter to a CCS agency and then they'll assign it to a case manager. And then they're going to reach out to you to come meet with you and talk about services, where you are on the wait list, all that sort of things. So that's how you get known to DDA. That's how you get started with DDA, that sort of thing. Um, so a relative, there's lots of services through DDA. Um, under the family support waiver, there's a smaller block of services. They can't get day services. They can't get employment services. Um, they can't get... Uh, residential services as i say that yeah there's certain services because they're expected to still be in school in with their families so there's a more limited range of services once you're in the community one of the other waivers which is the community pathways waiver or the community support waiver community path waiver is the original waiver and it, all the services are in that community supports waiver is a relatively new waiver that was to serve some families on the waiting list that not necessarily under age 21 um it has a it has almost all the DDA services in it, but residential. It does not have housing. It has housing support services, but it doesn't have residential supports. So um, you don't get to choose your waiver when the when the CCS. So when you so say your son or daughter has applied to DDA, they've come out on a comprehensive assessment. You've chosen your CCS agency to work with you. Then they've you've been assigned a worker. They're going to come out and meet with you, talk about what services would make sense for your son either now or in the future, and then. Uh, where you are on the waiting list. And then once your son or daughter becomes a priority for funding with DDA, like they're eligible when they start their last year of school and they're going to be exiting school in June, you know, at age 21, usually at the beginning of that school year, that's when really things start happening because they're going to start planning for him or her to exit school. So the, in usually for transitioning students, that's the term that DDA uses for the, that, the people in the last year of school, um, they, the, you know, they'll meet with you early in the school year, but they can't submit, apply for the waiver until usually in like February or March. But you don't need to worry about the waiver application. That's one of the roles of the CCS. They're going to meet with you. They're going to help you um, complete all the waiver waiver paperwork you need to do. It goes through a special um, group in, in Baltimore. It doesn't go through the normal channels of applying for Medicaid. Um, it's called the waiver. They waive some of the normal eligibility requirements for wait for Medicaid. So even if your son or daughter, like the household income might be too high for Medicaid to apply in the community, but under the waiver, that probably doesn't matter. There still is an asset limit. That's a really critical thing for folks to know. So the asset limit for medical assistance is $2,000. So you can't have more than $2,000 in your son or daughter's name. Um, cause that's going to count as an asset. So you can have the ways to protect assets if you want to save money for them or through an ABLE account or through a special needs trust. 
um, that money shielded from the waiver eligibility with Medicaid. But if you have a bank account and your name and your son's name is on it, that's a joint account. It counts as an asset for him. So that's something to be wary of. And if that's the same asset limit if you applied for SSI. So I would encourage if you haven't applied for SSI at age 18, you can apply only looking at your son or daughter's income and not the family income. Before age 18, they look at the family income. So lots of folks aren't eligible. But once your son or daughter is 18, you can apply solely with their information, even though they're still living with you. And then once they're eligible, the Medicaid waiver eligibility is almost the same as SSI. So once you've been determined eligible for SSI, you automatically qualify for medical assistance. And then you very likely will be, apply, be eligible for one of the DDA waivers. So it's a way to get a head start on the process and to get, um, you know, start getting some assets, some benefits, some monthly income for your son or daughter. And then the other advantage of that is that there's lots of work incentives. So if your goal is working employment for your son or daughter, it's much better to have SSI and then go to work than to be working and then apply for SSI. It's really hard to go the other way. There's lots of work incentives. They want you to try to work and reduce your dependence on SSI. So, so, um, so that's generally the thing. If you haven't applied at 18, apply for, for SSI. At, if you haven't applied for DDA at any age, now's the time to do it. Get them in the system, get them assigned to CCS agency, and then you're good to go. Then, they're, then they'll contact you when you're a priority for funding. So you don't really want, well, you've got to get them in, in the system, and then you pretty much don't have to do much until you're eligible. Um, so now specifically, um, the service that Ian asked me to talk about is the new DDA housing support services. And that's one of the new services that's available on all the waivers. Um, and housing support services is an initiative to help folks with disabilities live on their own, right? There's lots of barriers to that, right? This, they need supports, they have limited income, they need, a, they need affordable housing, they need accessible housing, there's lots of barriers. So this is one of the ways that DDA um, wants to try to address that. Um, so housing support services is not the same as residential services. So typically, if somebody needed to be placed and wanted to live separate from their family through DDA, they only had a couple of options. They have what they called shared supports, which the old term for that was adult foster care. So they, they would live with a family that gets a stipend to, to provide the care that they would need. Um, and there's still that's still an option for lots of folks. They, they, there's lots of folks that are in um, shared shared living, shared living. I say shared support, shared living, um, and that's like adult foster care. And then there's well, most folks are in what they would call they went back to the term with residential services, but DDA goes back to the term of group home now. So they they've gone back from group home, group home. They got rid of that term and now it's back. But a group home for us just means a, a home in the community that's owned or licensed by the ARC. So the ARC has 60 or 70 homes in the Baltimore, Baltimore City, Baltimore County area, and they're licensed by us. Generally, three people share a home. In residential services, the homes are, um, everyone has their own room, of course, but generally three people share the house and there's staff there to meet the needs of the folks that um, live in the house. Um, the, the staffing can vary based on the needs of the person who needs the most support, but most of our houses have somebody there all the time when the, when uh when the residents are not there um residential is highly subsidized so one of the reasons for residential is um, that people use that ch choice a lot of people say they want to live on their own but it's expensive to live on your own to get your own apartment right i have three grown daughters they all have roommates because you can't afford to live on their own right so um residential is highly subsidized so the way residential works is everyone pays 375 room and board to the state and then some people pay an additional contribution to care based on the income or um, their benefits. If they get SSA benefits based on the parent, they might pay an additional contribution to care, but it's highly subsidized. So most people, that includes the 375, includes the, the rent, the BG&E, the water bill, the food for the house, pretty much all the, all the stuff you need to live on. The only things that are not covered, folks in our houses split the cable bill. And they pay for their personal items, you know, their toiletries, their clothing, their vacations, you know, that sort of stuff. If they're working and they want to, you know, eat out, a, you know, lunch on Friday with work, that comes out of their pocket. If they want to pack a lunch, the, the, you know, the, the house has budget to buy food for them to pack a lunch, that sort of thing. So it's highly subsidized. Um, 
and it's a great deal. But the model is because it's subsidized, the model is its own and the ARC provides all of the, you know, the furnishings, all the stuff, all the, all the expenses of the house. So the model is generally three people sharing a home is how it works financially. So we have a couple homes that have four. I think four is the regulation. You can have up to four, but most of our homes have three. Um, and I'll so, just pipe in to say that um, the ARC isn't the only agency in yeah, our region that provides residential services. There's a lot of different oh, agencies. Dozens yeah. and dozens of them now. There's yeah. new ones like every month, new ones are coming up. So mm -hmm. yeah, there's lots of them. So the idea, you have to be eligible for some sort of DDA service first. Usually it's the transitioning youth where you would be thinking about day or employment services, but you now you can request residential. Well, I was going to say at the same time, but it depends on what waiver you're in. Lots of folks that are transitioning youth are in the initial um, supports waiver, and then they need to be in a community pathways waiver to, for residential. Residential is only in that community pathways waiver. So for instance, we have a, a, a young man um, who... Um, Kate, he's in employment services through the community path through community supports waiver and he wants residential. So his CCS is working with them to reapply for the waiver to request the community pathways waiver in, in the way to get residential. So you can be moved within the waivers as your services are needed. So you might start in one waiver as family support and then get in the community pathways waiver as you need additional services. Um, but in theory, if you were in community pathways waiver, when you're first coming out of school, you could apply for, um, employment services with the ARC and residential services with, um, another agency, right. All in the same waiver. So, um, and then there's another, there's another relatively new housing service called supported living. And the difference between supported living and residential services are, is, that it's the individual's house so their name is on the lease as opposed to a residential services an arc licensed home it's licensed by dda and medicaid it um you know it's 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 our we either own or lease the home um supported living is the person's home apartment they can live with whoever they want they can have roommates or not they can live alone um but it's not subsidized that's the big difference so the, it almost looks like residential, like a, from an outsider that visits the home and sees the level of support, like an agency like the ARC would provide the staffing, they provide the nursing oversight, all the responsibilities of the person's care, but it's in their home, not in a family's home, their own home would be at least like their own apartment, they're living alone. Um, or they can choose to have a roommate. We have one gentleman who he lives with um, one of his friends from um, his friends in college and he lives with him he known him since childhood and he gets supports from us for his part and the friend um in lieu of like reduced rent does like the overnight safety net right he's there overnight just for an emergency um but they get that's considered um supported living is an agency like the arc provides the staffing and the nursing and the oversight of the home but it's in the person's home so that's the difference between residential and supported living and I'll just add that if you are interested in that model of supported living, um, it might be a good idea to get your child after they're 18 on a Section 8 waiting list because it's a long waiting list. But um, once their name comes up, they can receive subsidized housing. Um, and that's a way to get subsidized. But we're going to move on, I think, and talk about this housing other school. thing that's not residential services. That's right. So that, so that brings us perfect timing, perfect um uh, segue into the housing support services. So housing support services um, is a service. So folks can get up to 175 hours a year of housing support services, and it can be added to their plan. So in, in adult services, you're going to have a, a PCP, person centered plan, very much like the IEP in school, right? It's going to discuss the services they're getting and need and that sort of thing. So um, housing support services can be added to the plan. Um, it's available on any of the waivers. Um, and an agency, you would choose an agency to provide that service. There's several in this area. I don't know the names of all of them. I know there's several. Um, so persons that an agency has to be licensed specifically for housing support services, well, they really have to be licensed for any service they provide, but housing support services has some additional requirements. Like there's train, there's specific trainings that need to be provided by DDA to someone to be a housing support specialist. So they have to go through a series of trainings. Um, and only that person can provide housing support services. 
Um, so for instance, the ARC has two people that do that as part of their job. So we don't have, we're relatively new at it. We maybe work with 10 individuals or so in housing support services. Um, and we're trying to, it's relatively new. Um, we're trying to grow it so that we can have like a full-time position or two half-time positions to do this as a key, a main part of their job, as opposed to a, a, a smaller part of their job. Um, but the agency has to have, um, a, trained housing support specialists to actually provide the service. I know one agency had a person go through all the trainings and then left, they left the agency so that the agency couldn't do provide it because they didn't have a person training until they got another person through. So it's new to everybody. It's not just new to families, it's new to agencies and DDA too. So it's relatively new. So the first step is you determine that you have a housing support need that you want to explore housing support services. And then what would happen is um, you would discuss it as a, at a team meeting, everything goes to a team meeting and the CCS revises the plan to include housing support services. Um, and then they would, they would pick an agency and the housing support specialist would meet with the person and discuss what they would want to what, what they want to happen with housing. Um, and it can be very basic. They're just starting to plan for the future. They don't, they need to, could be anything like maybe they need to establish some credit because you need things to get to get your own apartment. You need to have a good credit history. You need to have have credit in general, right? A lot of the folks coming out of school, especially, but even a lot of adults that we work with don't have any credit. Nothing's in their name, right? So that's a, that's a barrier. Um, so whatever their needs are, some people are closer to, you know, maybe they're, they got to get a job before they can um, to move out on their own. So that's part of their plan. So it can be from very basic, you want to live on your own and you want to have goals and in a year or two, you want to be in your own apartment to somebody who is more urgent. Um, but you can have up to 175 hours a year of housing support services in your plan. It's usually not provided on like a regular basis, like 10 hours a week or something like that, because it's very, it's variable, right? So a lot of times, the first thing the housing support specialist has to do is develop a housing support plan individualized for you that becomes part of the person's PCP. So like I said, it'd be different for different people. Some people you know, have a good job, they just need help finding an apartment and maybe you know, understanding the lease, signing the documents, doing the walkthrough, getting a down payment together, that sort of thing. Other people are just, like I said, establish, need to establish credit, need to clear up some of their credit, need to, um, you know, whatever, develop, a, set up a separate bank account from their parents, whatever, the, whatever it is. Um, it's gonna be an individualized plan that's gonna be, uh, um, uploaded into their PCP, and then that person would work with them on a, on a basis as, like, for instance, maybe somebody who is just starting to plan for that, they'd only meet with them once every two weeks or once a month or whatever to talk about it. Then as they get closer to needing ready to move out, would maybe much more involved, right? They're like taking them to look at apartments, filling out applications with them to apartments. They're helping them apply to BG&E. They're helping, you know, all the things involved with, um, helping them budget figure out what they can afford what their what their um, maximum rent would be all that sort of stuff so it it can vary you know it's kind of available on an as needed basis for the person as their needs change throughout the plan year um so the ccs's role in this is to be part they're part of the team so it's a team decision to add housing support services to to the plan so that's pretty much it and they're also supposed to help you identify a how, like for any service to help you identify a provider, right? And you don't have to use, as Ann said, you don't have to use the same provider for all your services, right? You could get housing support services from us. You could get day services from Abilities Network or residential, I mean, um, employment services or and respite services to another provider. It's all mix and match. Um, so the CCS, um, it's not their responsibility to help you find an apartment. A lot of them, before this was a service, a lot of them by default, they they ended up doing some of this stuff, but they didn't, didn't have any special expertise or or training in this. So um, so they're to help you identify a provider to provide the housing support services and then get it into the plan. And then once the funding is approved, then it, the agency would start working with your son or daughter to with housing support plan. Um, so as I said, the housing support assessment is supposed to help you through the whole process, right? The first thing is to develop a house individualized housing support plan. Um, and so they're supposed to talk with you about, you know, understanding what's involved in getting your own place, right? There's responsibilities, right? There, you don't have mom doing your laundry anymore. You don't, you have to do grocery shopping. So you have to figure out first, I mean, the obvious thing is what you can afford, right? So, um, 
you know, apartments are expensive. So if you're only getting SSI benefits of $890 a month, you can't afford an apartment that's $1,100 a month, right? So how are you going to solve that, right? Are you going to, are you going to take on roommates? Do you know somebody you want to live with? Do you need to get subsidized housing? Um, you know, what, what's, what are your options? So, um, so they're going to help you work through some of that stuff. They're going to come up with a realistic goal. Um, and so they're going to meet with you, determine the goals. Uh, they're going to, when you're ready to apply for an apartment, you think you're ready, they're going to help you with that. They're going to take you to look at apartments. They're going to help you fill out the application, um, do all the process, walk you through all the steps. One of the things with, um, you know, it's complicated, right? Especially if you've never done it before. You know, a lot of times the landlords want to see that you've had experience living somewhere else, right? So they're supposed to advocate for you that, you know, because of your disability, just like they would with, with employment supports or any other supports, they're supposed to help you find a landlord, find an apartment that will, um, can meet your needs. Um, and they, part of the figuring out living on your own is not only what you can afford and where you want to live, but also the supports you're going to need to, to be successful living there, right? So, are you independent enough to be completely on your own in the apartment? You just need a little help finding it. Do you need um, somebody somebody to come in every other day to help you with figure things out? Do you need somebody to check on you? Who's going to manage, help you manage your money? Is that still going to be family or you need an agency to be involved in that? Um, so in that situation, in theory, you could get, if you need a lot of supports, you could get uh, supported living which an agency would provide the support services in your apartment or home. Um, if you needed fewer hours, you don't need for housing, for supported living, you're supposed to need six hours a day of support. So if somebody that just needs somebody dropping in a couple hours a night, that's not supported living. Supported living is more like residential. You need a fair amount of support um, on a daily basis, um, but you have your own place. <coughs> Um, we support people that have their own apartment or either live on their own or they live with a roommate to make it affordable. And they might get 15 hours a week of drop-in supports from us. That, that would be considered personal supports. And they can help with all kinds of things like help them find a doctor, help help with grocery shopping, help them go through their, their bills every month and help them pay their bills, whatever, you know, whatever is needed. Um, they're the kind of services. That's not housing support services. That's personal supports. But the housing support specialist job is to figure out what supports that person is supposed to need and then work with the CCS to apply. If it's personal supports, they need somebody 20 hours a week to come every other day for three hours or whatever. Then the CCS is supposed to help the person find an agency that can provide that service. So that's a... So you can combine this service with other services. Yeah, yeah. It almost always is combined with another service. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, and then once you're in... Um, so as Ian said, Section 8 is a hard thing to negotiate. So one of the things that the Housing Support Special can do is help you apply for some of those subsidies, the Section 8. There's actually a lot of different programs. Not everyone is in every county, um, but like there's there's things called like the Weinberg buildings that are subsidized. There's some senior buildings that take people with SSI that are younger, that are subsidized. They're all depends on, there's lots of different programs that they have to federal programs. And the Housing Specialist knows about a lot of them. So they can help you apply. Uh, but the bottom line is, it's hard to get a subsidy, right? Everybody wants affordable housing, disability or not, right? If you ask, it's a huge issue, not just in Maryland or Baltimore, but all around the whole country. So the waiting list, I think Baltimore County closed for years and then it opened back up briefly and closed again. Um, and I think they were saying it's a seven year wait, uh, if you can even get on the list. Baltimore City opened again briefly this year. So the Housing Support Specialist can help you help your son or daughter apply to those programs, but that doesn't mean you're going to get the subsidy, right? There's no special priority for, you got you got DDA housing support services. You're on the list with everybody else. Um, and then once you're in your apartment, so once you figure out a subsidy or not, you have your own apartment, you have a roommate or not, you have the support you need. Um, they're there to help you understand the lease, your responsibility as a tenant, right? Like you can't, whatever. If there's, if the rule is you can't hang your laundry on the balcony, you can't do that, right? Or whatever it is. You can't have pets. You can't have people over that aren't on the lease living there long term. There's lots of rules with apartments. They need you to help you understand that. If there is an issue with you or from the landlord, you know, they're here, there to be like a, a negotiator to try to intervene and kind of save the situation. Um, eviction prevention activities. Um, you know, if you do have a subsidy or have housing paperwork, you have to update even after you're in, they would do that. So housing support services will help you find the apartment, get the apartment and then keep the apartment. Right. So it's like all three of those phases. 
Um, and as I said, it'd probably be um, how how often the person's working with them would be very different, right? As I'm just starting to plan for an apartment, you might only work with me once a month for a couple hours to start talking about where I want to live, how much I can afford, what am I doing, planning the steps and credit. And then once I am ready to find an apartment, you're probably going to be seeing me a lot because you're going to be taking me to look at apartments. You're going to be taking me to you know apply for apartments, all that sort of stuff. Once I get in, they're going to make sure you understand the lease. They're going to do all that piece, get the supports in place, all that sort of thing. And then once you're settled and doing okay, they probably would back out again and only be doing some follow along stuff, right? So it's going to be up and down of how much support you get through housing support services. Um, Am I correct that, that housing supports is considered a time limited service? It's not ongoing for a person's life. It's 175 hours a year. I don't know how they do it. I don't know if it's lifetime or not. We know we've never done that, but we never got that far. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think sure. they can have 175 hours, 175 hours a year. So I think if you got it this year and didn't get an apartment, you might not use up all your hours, right? Like if you're not really ready to move out, we might have only done some initial stuff with you and worked 26 hours with you this year. Then I think you could add 175 hours to next year's plan. I don't think it would be minus the 26. So as long as you need it, you can keep on. I think you'll keep getting it, right? But we'd be hopefully you'd have the supports in place that you wouldn't need housing support services indefinitely but pretty much if you're in a subsidy you probably need help filling out the paperwork at least once a year right mm -hmm. and so um so yeah it's there to i think it's there to ongoing as long as you keep adding it to the plan um now this is a part that people are excited about but also disappointed about when we talk about it so a, a part of the housing support service plan is dda has recognized that one of the barriers to people with disabilities getting their own place is affordability. And there's long waiting lists, you know, all across the country for affordable housing. So DDA has come up with a housing subsidy, which is very much like a section eight. So it's like section eight, it's almost a mirror image of section eight, but it's DDA funding. So instead of state and federal money, county money, whatever goes into the different various housing subsidies, this is DDA's money but it looks a lot like section eight. Actually, it's a, you apply for it the same way. The housing support service, housing support specialist can add somebody's name. Once they're in housing, have housing support services active in their plan, they can add the person's name to the wait list for section eight, the DDA housing subsidy, all that stuff is on the same, through the same web portal. So every, you can't apply yourself through that, but the housing support specialist can apply for all those things for the person. Um, through the web portal. So the housing support subsidy from DDA, as I said, it looks very much like Section 8, which generally you pay about 30% of the cost of living. So your BG&E is subsidized and your average market rate is subsidized too. So you pay, the average person pays about 30% of their income towards their housing costs, which includes their BG&E. So that's that's what we would hope would be available for folks. That's what that would be. That's what everybody wants. When everybody, I get calls every week about housing support services and they all want the subsidy. And I have to tell them, well, the subsidy, most people can get the housing support service. Not many people are going to get the housing subsidy, right? That's a small percentage. They targeted 50 people the first year for DDA in the whole state, right? So that's not a lot of folks. Um, and I'm not 100% accurate and sure if this is accurate, but I heard this week that only five people have gotten a subsidy this year since July. So we've had one person with the ARC get one last month, get one just recently. They, they came through um, and they got the, the DDA subsidy. We had somebody else get the Baltimore County subsidy like last month that their name came up on the list um, for that. But uh, We've only had one for this without a housing support specialist, without having it be part yes, of the plan, right? That's so. true. Yes. Yes. Um, and there's different priorities for that. So um, so even if the 50 were taken in the fiscal year, it's still small likelihood that your son or daughter is going to be one of the ones to get that. And there are separate priorities for who gets the, the subsidies initially. So um, the first subsidy is that DDA is already paying for a housing a rent subsidy. The DDA doesn't do that anymore, but in the old days they used to, and they, they're grandfathered in. There's some people that are paying. Like I know, for instance, we have somebody we just talked about that they get a, a small rent subsidy from DDA now that are not through the, before long before the housing the housing support services were available. So he 
in theory would be a priority for DDA because they're already paying a rent subsidy to do that. So they're the first priority. DDA is going to catch up on the folks they're already providing um, rent subsidies to. And the big per push for DDA, why that's a priority for DDA, is that right now state, the rent subsidy is state only money. And under the housing support thing, there's going to get some federal matching funds. So that's they want to clean that up. So that's why they're a top priority. And then the second category is homeless. And it could be various types of homelessness, right? Like you are literally homeless on the street. You could be like at risk of homeless, like you have limited options There's for different things. Uh, you're going to lose your shelter within 14 days, unaccompanied youth, youth um, you're fleeing or attempted to flee domestic violence, uh, in, you're in temporary housing, that sort of thing. So all very serious situations, right? So that's what that's the priority for folks who are to get the subsidy. So one of the fellas that we just, they got the one gentleman who we work with, they got the subsidy, he was homeless. So technically he was staying with his grandmother temporarily with a time limited time he could stay, right? So um, so that's why he got the funding, he was in that. The third category is you're transitioning from long term care facility. <clears throat> that's not gonna apply to many folks that, that were there on this call. That's gonna be people coming out of like state institutions. There's still a couple of them in Maryland or a nursing home, something like that, right? So they're gonna be a priority because Medicaid's already paying for that. So that's why they're a priority. Um, then this is one where some people would qualify, living with a caregiver who is 55 or older and is no longer able to care for the applicant. So this is one, we don't really have much experience with this because it's a new service, like it, it says 55 or older, but if you're 55 and older and in good health, doesn't sound like you would qualify to me, right? It says unable to continue to care for the person. Maybe it's gonna, maybe it would depend on the needs of the person with the disability, right? If they have severe needs, it could very well be they can't manage the care anymore. If they just need a house, that probably wouldn't be a priority, I wouldn't think. So I'm not sure how DDA is gonna interpret that um, as they get through these other priorities, but they haven't gotten through these first two priorities yet. So, um, so we haven't really had much experience with that. And then the fifth priority is transitioning from a group home um, or shared living or foster care. So those are three residential options that I talked about before that currently are available. And, you know, we have some, we have a number of folks that live in our residential homes that certainly could live in their own home. They would like to live in their own home. They have the skills to live there with drop-in supports. They're only in residential because they didn't have any other options and it's subsidized. So, but if they could get, so they are a priority, they want to get their own apartment, um, but they're the fifth priority, right? So they're not probably um, in this first go around or second go around where server is going to get, be able to move out, but they are considered. And then other people as funding, well, this is the same. These are almost the same priorities for all DDA services. You, you have to be like the, the most urgent people are served first. And then as they're served, they go down the list and look at the next category, the next category, the next category. One exception is the transitioning youth funding, which is for kids exiting school. That's the criteria. They're exiting school at age 21 and they are DD eligible. They're the only criteria. So that's how most people get in. Um, most of the other services, priority categories have like a an urgency, a risk factor, DDA would call them, right? And part of that. Um, do you think that the subsidy represents a savings for DDA over regular residential supports? I think it, uh, it's hard to say. I would say yeah. yes, because it's residential certainly subsidized already, right? So DDA, so they're already paying a subsidy in that. And then I would imagine that most of the people that would move into their own apartment would be, um, need fewer supports. Yeah. So they could get like 10 hours of drop-in supports as opposed to around the, like residential is kind of around the clock care, right? Even though you might not need it. I mean, we have people in residential at various levels, right? In the same house, there could be people that have a wake overnight supervision and the other guy drives and he goes to work and comes and goes as he pleases, but he's there. The, the level of staff in the house and supervision is based on the person in the house that needs the most support, right? So if somebody has seizures during the night, they need a wake overnight supervision. I don't need that, that, but I so I can come and go. But I just share a room in that house, right? I get help when I need it for certain things I need help with, but I don't need to be supervised all the time just because I'm in a house where there's staff. So there's varying on that. So those kind of people that would probably like to have their own place, they're more independent, and then but they can't afford it. Um, so then they would get less DDA funding for support services. So residential is expensive, right? That's the most expensive service. So. Um, so. Are you ready to move on through some questions if people have them? Yep, I think so. I think we covered most of the basics. Mm -hmm. 
So what are your questions today? Nothing in the chat box. You can ask Bob questions about pretty much anything about DDA or the services that the ARC provides because he's knowledgeable about the gamut. So if you, um, you know, listen to the first part of the DDA um, explanation and that's, um, you know, where your questions are, I'm sure he, he has information for you there. I appreciate this information because it's been confusing to me um, what, what exactly this new service is. So right. I... Um, well, one thing that I will mention that I didn't is that uh, there's a lot of new services and not there's not a lot of providers I didn't mention it for housing preservers. There's not a lot of providers in the area that are offering it because you have to go through the training more and more are doing it. But for the instance, the arc right now, we are not able, if, if you have, if your student was graduating in June or graduated June and starting services in July, and you said, we want to add housing support services to his plan. I don't know that we could do it because of capacity, mm -hmm. right? We're, we are pretty much working with the people we, support we've been you know supporting already with through an employment or some other service that need the service and so we as i said the way our we have two people um trained and they're doing it as part of their case management job so we're trying to figure out the ratio of like how, how many hours we're going to average with housing support services versus how much money it brings in can it be half of a job we'd like to get to it that there it's a full-time position with the arc right housing support and then how many how many people could they one person support? We haven't figured any of that out yet because it's relatively mm -hmm. new. Like I said, we're working with about 10 or 12 people now in housing support services. We've placed two. Um, but now that we've placed two, we could take a couple more. But is it, um, can we take more that aren't really connected to the ARC at this point? It depends if we have internal folks that need it, they know they're going to be priority. So, mm -hmm. and I think other agencies are probably going to be in the same situation, right? In that they're have, they don't have enough staff committed to be able to provide unlimited amount. We have that with other services too. So it's not just um, behavioral support services. Another one that we have, we provide that service, but our clinical team is swamped with our internal folks. So I get calls every week from like somebody with the eligible family support waiver saying, you know, do you provide that behavioral support services for my son or daughter? And I'm like, we're not in a position to do that yet. So there's just because you're eligible for DDA doesn't mean there's a provider out there. Mm -hmm. that can work with you right away but hopefully that won't be too long and you know you can always revise the plan and that's one thing that i want to just like the iep right so if say you came out of um your son comes out of school and figures out they want this employment program with abilities network or whatever it is and they chose that and that's the only service they have in the plan that's fine and then if in six months you decide that you want to add housing support services and we're able to do it the ccs can revise the plan to add that service you don't have to wait till the next plan year I mean, it happens all the time, right? And so as you, once you get your foot in the door with DDA and you get one waiver service, it's easier to stack other services on. It's hard to get that first bite where you get the, when you get in, right? There's a waiting list and all that, get into the waiver. Once you're in a waiver, there is some, you have to justify the need for some things, but it's a good time to be applying for DDA services. They're not denying a whole lot like they were five or 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Five or 10 years ago, even if you're in the waiver, you were it was hard to get anything additional because it was just the money was tight. It really depends on how much money the state allocates to DDA every year, right? And how much, and then they get matching federal money, but DDA is putting the money up front. So it's based on how much money DDA puts in. So I always put in a plug that you should be advocating with your legislatures to fully fund mm -hmm. DDA services. We're down in Annapolis every February mm -hmm. advocating for that because I remember 10 years ago, even the transition youth funding was cut in half at the last minute and mm -hmm. out of 300 kids graduated in Baltimore City and Baltimore County and 120 were funded by DDA. That's a pretty rare thing to have happen. That was scary. Yeah. Yeah. It was um, all tight. Uh, what if you're self-directing your supports? How does how do you fit housing support services in there? Can can anybody become a a licensed um, support services provider? That's a good question. I don't see why not. I don't yeah. know the answer to that. Okay. So you're right. saying I'm like I'm like so you're my you're son or daughter and they were yeah. self-directed. Could I become HSS and pay myself? Mm -hmm. Or somebody we know. Or somebody, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Somebody that's not connected with an agency. Or do they just purchase the service from the agency? 
So I guess two things. So one, there's a cost associated with the training, which I don't mm -hmm. think they would pay for in the self-directed thing. Okay. So like mm -hmm. the agency paid, I mean, if I remember, I think it was $750 for the initial training. Okay. For DVA. So there's a cost. And then there's some follow-up trainings, um, like on budgeting and on the, uh, le le I don't know, something to do with the apartments. But mm -hmm. um, so there's that part. Um, but self-directed is a whole separate issue with being able to buy services. So we, we do AT and environmental assessments all the time through kind of one-time only services through self-directed people buy that service from us because we're the licensed provider to provide them and they can't do it themselves through self-directed, but families want to buy, go self-directed and buy like employment services from us or other services from us um, or like housing support services. We would say at this time we couldn't do it. Um, there's a capacity issue, but more so there's also a administration issue. It's really hard to bill self-directed services. To be honest, it's a nightmare for me to just to bill one time only for like one time we did a housing assess an environmental assessment. That's a one time fee. Sometimes we do I have to send like 20 invoices. It doesn't get to the thing. It takes us six months to get paid. They all say, I thought you did that because like, we build a family and there's like it's just a whole system. There's different ones. I, you know, there's some, some are out of state, the, the financial management people, it's just a nightmare. And to do something where you'd like this or employment services or housing support services, where you're going to have like a few hours this month and then a lot of hours next month and tracking all that, there's like an administrative nightmare, to be honest. So um, we're looking at being able to do that because we want families to be able to be self-directed and be able to buy services from us, but it's really difficult. So I would say at this point, if you're self coming out of school this year or next year and going self-directed, you're probably not going to be able to buy housing support services from us or employment mm -hmm. services. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're looking at maybe day because that's more of a regular. Right. But employment's the same way. It's like when you're looking for a job, it's so many hours a month. Then when you get a job, it's much more intense and just tracking all that and billing for it and making sure you get paid. It's a whole nother world. Right. Okay, this slide shows more information. There's a DDA housing support services at a glance page, um, and that's where you'll find it online. Um, also, if you go to YouTube, there's a number of DDA webinars that have been recorded and you can just go to YouTube and, and sit in and listen on them. And there was one a couple of years ago on housing support services by kind of the expert that DDA retained to to you know be the be the voice of, of the service. And there's Bob's uh, uh, email address if you have follow-up questions that you'd like to um, contact him. I'm sure he'd love to hear from you. Yeah, even about eligibility or housing support service in general or anything, mm -hmm. um, feel free to reach out to my email. Um, I did forget to mention one thing that you had mentioned, um, uh, asked me about this morning. There is a service called Transitioning Housing or Transition Services. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of when they get to the point that they're signing a lease, they can request some, because another factor, one of the, Catch 22, right? Under the waiver and under Medicaid, you can't save more than $2,000. So how do you save money for the security deposit and the bg &E down payment, all that kind of stuff? So you can apply for up to $5,000 of transition services. So DDA has thought that through a little bit, right? So you can apply for, um, it can be used for like the bg &E deposit, the security deposit, moving expenses to buy some furniture, things like that. Things that under residential, the agency would be responsible for. So you can apply for that. Um, that's, um, you, you don't apply for that until you're at the point of like getting ready to look for apartments, right? And then you can apply for what you think you need. I didn't know about that part. That's that's good. Yeah, yeah. so that's a, that's a good thing. And I think it's lifetime, $5,000. So the one guy that just moved in, he had he had a fair amount of income and money so he he we spent about 2500 through dda for him we wanted to save some in case he needs to move we we have a history with him so he, he might need the funding in the future so we didn't want to spend it all um so we helped him get some like donated furniture and things for some of his stuff he bought the things he needed with dda but we didn't we didn't blow it all thinking they had like five thousand dollars to spend and then would never have money because it's lifetime so we wanted to save a little for him so um, but that is supposed to help with that. But families could certainly contribute too, right? Like I, I still pay my kids cell phones, even though they're 30 years old. You know, it just it's, you, you know, and there was the sports can be a mix of things, right? Like family, um, you know, can provide the do the help them with their budgeting, right? And then an agency maybe would help them with the grocery shopping and medical appointments. You know, it's a it's a 
that's part of the house where is to figure out a plan that makes sense for that individual. So it doesn't mean they're on their own and the family's not helping them or not involved. Right. And, you know, certainly the family can, you know, buy them a kitchen table. Right? You know what I mean, that's, that's not out of their money. So it's a, co a cooperative event, right? Like to help people move in on their own. Um, so there is a question about where to find this recording um, later, and that's a great question. This recording and many other of our presentations are available. This one, it takes a few days to get for our uh, IT person to get it up there, but um, it's available if you go to BCPS web, website and go to the Department of Special Education along the side, it's, uh, there's a tab for transition, and that's where you'll find all of our recordings under under here. And this one, I would give it till the end of the week, probably it would be available there. <clears throat> and I will also make sure that the PowerPoint uh, slides are available there too. Okay, um, I'm gonna turn the recording off.